on the day that death surrendered to the mighty cross of Jesus Christ the earth would shake beneath the weight of dark and sky on his brow a crown of sorrow for a king whose weakness was our strength no word he spoke his love was shown for all to see oh the cross of jesus christ is the reason of life for him That's true. Let's stand up. Let's sing with Tina this morning. Now the dawn of resurrection. Now the dawn of resurrection floods the night as hope prevails to shine. Salvation waits our chains to
the Lord. That's what we're here to do today, right? Absolutely. This is not a posture of worship today. This is a posture of worship. Bless the Lord for the great and mighty things he has done in our lives. Bless his holy name. It's going to be a good, good, good day in the Lord's house today. So many reasons why, but primarily just because God is already here. The Holy Spirit is moving in this place. Would you open your hearts to God today. Amen. That's what it's really all about. Let's pray to that end today. Father, focus us now 
on you. Focus us on your word, on your goodness, on your holiness, on your righteousness. Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted. Comfort us where we need to be comforted. Lord, move in this place today. Father, thank you that we are able to gather as a body of believers today, lifting up the name of Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us never grow weary of doing that or taking it for granted in any way. What an awesome privilege it is to worship our mighty God in such a free way today, God. We appreciate that, and we thank you, and we glorify you all morning long. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can have a seat for a moment. We're doing a little swap today. Pastor Jim is over at our Spanish Trail campus preaching to that uh, campus. And Dan Davis, the campus pastor from Spanish Trail, will be here. In fact, he's here this morning. Give a warm welcome to Dan Davis. So we're looking forward to what the Lord's laid on your heart today, Dan. And uh, we're ready to continue with our time of worship. Tell you what, uh, there's probably some guests here today. Almost every Sunday, we've got multiple guests that have come to see what's going on at Hillcrest, to see if you can find a church family. We definitely are wanting to welcome you today. And we're not going to point you out. We're not going to embarrass you, ask you to raise your hands or anything crazy like that. But we want you to know that we are glad that you're here and that we try to be the best we can just all about the Word of God and Jesus Christ to make that the primary thing and coming together to push back the darkness in our world with the light of Jesus Christ. We're becoming like Christ by worshiping, connecting, and serving. And uh, there may be some of you here this morning that can only check one of those boxes today. Maybe, maybe you're only coming to worship today. We'd love for you to get involved and take that next step. Get involved in Connect Group where you can really do some life together. Get involved in a connect group where you can go a little deeper and where somebody is guaranteed to know uh, when you're not there and they can check on you and care for you and find a place to serve as well. There's so many, so many opportunities at Hillcrest to plug in your gifts. I mean, maybe you sing or play an instrument. Come talk to me. Maybe you're a teacher. You know, come talk to Eric. Maybe you like to drive a golf cart because it looks really fun. You know, um, you know, there's lots of things you can do. And uh, those are just a few of them. So get involved make a difference in our world today. We're going to continue with our time of worship this morning. We've been singing this for several years now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand as we sing the great song, Cornerstone. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on blood and righteousness oh, I dare not trust the sweetest rain but only trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone we made strong the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face,
trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the really what it's about. Amen. Only through the grace of Jesus Christ that we could stand in righteousness in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got a great song for you. You can have a seat. It's called Thou, O Lord. Great song of worship. I think you're going to enjoy it. Make sure you're worshiping along with us.
sit. Stand and give God glory. Hallelujah. The lifter of my head. When we are down and defeated, he lifts our head. Praise God. We're about to make a reference about wood being wet and, and lighting it on fire, like I so awkwardly did a few weeks ago. I will not do that. But by golly, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Live by that song this week, church family. Live by that song right there. There's nothing more that Satan wants is to knock us down, defeat us, make you feel like you're not worthy. You are worthy. You're a child of God, the lifter of our head. Let's continue to worship. Father God, as we give of our tithes and offerings, it is because you have given to us first. It is all yours in the first place. We're giving an offering back to you, God, in worship, in song, in giving, in our time, in our service. Father, because you have saved us and you sustain us, we thank you for all of that and so much more that words cannot even put into comprehension today, God. So we just worship you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. church family. And yes, I still am family, even though I'm at Spanish Trail. Thank you very much. And uh, man, I, I can't decide if I'm more grateful to be here uh, preaching and teaching and fellowshipping with you or that I'm more grateful that Jim's over there doing it with Spanish Trail. Um, I think I'm equally as grateful for both um, and just equally grateful that God has seen fit to allow us uh, as a church to reach our city through multiple locations. Um, and we thank you deeply for that. As a, Spanish trail, as a Spanish Trail campus pastor, um, I know without a shadow of a doubt, we wouldn't be able to do what we do over there if it weren't for you, um, our sending church. And uh, we are so thankful to be a part of the body at Hillcrest over at Spanish Trail. and so thankful to be here with you this morning to dig into God's word. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts 18, uh, continuing on in our Scent series. <clears throat> and so I'd ask that you uh, turn there, scroll there, flip there, whatever means of the, the word you have in your hand today. I ask you to flip over there to Acts 18. Uh, we're going to look at the first 17 verses. And I know I'm thinking the same thing you are, 17 verses. That's a lot. And so I hope you uh, came with an empty stomach because we're going to fill it up with God's word today. Um, but to, that, to do that, we better get started. As you're turning to Acts 18, I want to tell you a story this morning um, that honestly I haven't shared very much publicly. Uh, one, it's a relatively personal story. But two, it's not a very fond memory of mine. Um, and it's a story that started about 12 years ago um, when we were, Rachel and I, my wife, were heading to the hospital to uh, welcome our new baby girl into the world, our very first child. Everything had gone very normally, very normal pregnancy. And um, so we went to the hospital. It was time for that to happen. And so as we got there, everything was going smoothly, but began to find delays um, and led to a very long, long labor and delivery. Uh, Rachel was in labor for about 25 or 26 hours. Um, it turned out to be a very 
challenging time, that process, as it is a lot of times, um, but even uh, more so in this particular case. And so we got to the point where toward the end of that time, um, the doctors and nurses discovered that not only did Rachel have a fever, begin to have a fever to spike up, but the, the baby did as well. And so um, we became, began to become concerned, um, as did the doctors, and they began to kind of break the news. If we don't do something soon, we're going to have to have a C-section and kind of go into some emergency protocols. And by God's grace, um, the delivery happened and everything went really smooth and just a small fever after the fact uh, for both Rachel and our little girl. Um, and so they rushed the little baby off to the nursery to check on her, make sure everything's going okay, get some antibiotics going, the same going for Rachel. And as things kind of settled down, um, the doctors and nurses started going away and doing their things, and Rachel kind of just passed out, man, just exhausted from the ordeal. And then I did too. I sat down in a chair there in the room and just took it all in for a second. And as I was doing that, I just happened to glance over at Rachel. I noticed that she didn't look super great, um, just didn't look normal. And I know you don't look super great after having a 26-hour labor and delivery. I get that, okay? That's not a, not a judgmental statement. It was just a fact. Things just didn't look normal, even though she just had a 26-hour labor and delivery. But I kind of wrote it off to like, I'm a new dad. What do I know? The doctors and nurses aren't in here. Things have got to be okay. And so I kept on going, just kind of sitting, relaxing, and taking it all in, thinking about our new family. Um, and then kind of look over again, and she looks worse. I mean, so I'm, I've watched enough uh, television to know when people don't look normal. Um, and so I poked my head out the door, and, and there's a nurse happened to be coming back that way. And I said, hey, do you mind just, you know, taking a look? I'm not sure what's going on. She just doesn't look normal to me in all of my doctorly wisdom. Um, and so she goes, yeah, sure, I'll go check her out. And she didn't even make it inside of the room. And this look came over her face um, that I have never forgotten to this day. Um, she didn't even make it to her bedside until she turned around immediately and ran outside and pressed some button on the wall and sirens and lights went off and doctors and nurses came running. And the next thing I know, we are in the middle of a real life ER episode right there in this hospital. And I did not know what to do, no, did not know what to think. Um, our syringes and needles are coming out and they're jabbing them in her thigh and the doctors are everywhere and alarms and buzzers are going off all around her and she looks terrible. Um, and by God's grace and by the great work of that hospital team there, everything turned out okay. We've got a beautiful 12-year-old daughter now that's just as tall as Rachel. We've got a beautiful son who's about to turn nine and we've got a beautiful wife. And then there's me, I'm pulling up the rear there, but I'm still hanging on in the family. But guys, I can tell you, during that time, I've never been more afraid. Fear came over me from head to toe. I was so afraid. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was so afraid. My daughter was down the hall, just a few hours old. My wife is laying in the bed, seemingly dying. And I was overwhelmed with fear. And as we look into this passage today, in Acts 18, we're going to see another man that is afraid, overwhelmed with fear and worry, and for good reason. And that man is the Apostle Paul. Yes, Paul was scared. And sometimes we put some of the heroes of the Bible up on this really high pedestal like they don't worry about things like that. We wrongly imagine that they must, must not have struggled with the things that we struggle with. If I had to pick words to describe the Apostle Paul, I would say words like bold and fearless, courageous and determined. I would not think of words like fearful or discouraged or distressed or weak. Yet Paul describes how he felt during these early days in Corinth. In 1 Thessalonians, he uses words like distressed and weakness and fear and much trembling. In 1 Corinthians 2, 3, he says it like this, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Even though he was a giant in the faith, Paul struggled with the same emotions, the same struggles that we do. And he came to Corinth afraid. And so what does Paul have to be afraid of here? Why is he so scared? Why is he so concerned to the point of weakness, he says. Well, I think if we take a look back at Paul's journey that led him here, we might see why he's coming into Corinth this way. Just a year earlier in Paul, Paul's ministry, his closest 
friend, Barnabas, he and Barnabas had split up. They had had a disagreement um, and, and parted ways. Paul went his separate way with Silas. And, and so as Paul and Silas are going on in their missionary journey through Asia, the Holy Spirit would not allow them to go forward preaching the word. And then the Spirit would not allow them to go into the Bithynia. I'm sure they were feeling a bit aimless and beat down a little bit at this point. And then Paul had a vision of a man asking them to come to Macedonia. And so they go there. And their first stop was in Philippi, where they were quickly stripped and beaten and jailed. And they're forced out of town. And from there, they go to Thessalonica, where they flee by night to avoid another mob that's looking to beat them. And they move on to Berea, only to be followed by the mob from Thessalonica. And Paul then flees by himself to Athens. And once there, he sends back word to Silas and Timothy, please come as quickly as you can. And then Paul is essentially laughed out of Athens for preaching the thing that is most dear to him, Christ and the resurrection. And remember, all these things happened over about a year's time. And so it's understandable, really, that Paul is pretty low at this point of his life as he comes in to Corinth. And so as we pick up this story in Acts 18, starting in the first four, first four verses, verse one says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, like we just talked about, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And so our passage this morning picks up as Paul comes into Corinth. And the first thing that Luke tells us about Paul's time in Corinth is that he finds this man named Aquila. And so to add to Paul's tough times over this past year, he now finds himself in Corinth without money. And so he had to go find work. And being trained as a tent maker, that's his trade, he found a Jewish tent maker named Aquila and his wife Priscilla, and they stayed, and he stayed with them there in Corinth. They worked together and began to make money. And this was the first time in Paul's missionary journeys that he had to work using his trade to support himself. And so as he's doing that with Priscilla and Aquila, we don't know whether or not Aquila and Priscilla uh, became, uh, had become Christians during their time in Rome or if Paul had led them to Christ once he came to Corinth. But it, based on the nature of their relationship, it seems that they were believers. Um, he was staying at their home. They were working together. They had seemed to be having a lot in common. And what a gift a relationship like this must have been to Paul during this very difficult time. He came to a, time, a place and a time where he knew nobody. He had no money. I mean, didn't know where to find work, and he found this couple, this friendship, this relationship that let him live with them and, and work with them and support himself. You know, relationships like this in our lives are so valuable. And this isn't the main point of this text, but I think it's worth talking about. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had relationships like this in my life when I've been in a tough place. Um, and as I was thinking about this passage this week and, and what this relationship must have meant to Paul, um, I thought of one particular relationship with some friends of ours that we met way back in college. Rachel and um, this friend were roommates in college, and then we introduced each other um, to, the, or they introduced us to their significant others, the boyfriends at the time. Um, and we began to spend time together and do life together. And, um, and then we entered into the season of having kids together and did that life together and laughed and cried about all the good times and the bad, th bad times. They were the couple that showed up first in the hospital during that terrible time of delivery with our daughter in the middle of the night, driving three hours. We end up going off to seminary together and dreaming about ministry. We even joked around about one day working in ministry together, and how cool that might be, but understanding that God probably would never do that, and he did. You guys know them as Dustin and April Scott. They're our student pastor and his wife. They are close godly friends to us, a precious gift to us from God. And so I can identify with Paul's experience in Corinth. I've received the same type of gift in my life that he received in Aquila and Priscilla. Do you have a Priscilla and Aquila in your life? 
Has God brought to you near and dear Christian friends that soothe your weary heart when you're low, fearful, broken? Has God brought those kinds of friends to you? And better yet, have you sought those kinds of friends out? Sometimes you have to go looking for friends like that, for relationships like that. So if you're feeling weak and fearful, ask God to send you a Christian brother and sister to come alongside you in faith, to build you up, to encourage you, and ask God to give you the courage to seek out those relationships. You will not regret it. And likewise, are you being a Priscilla and Aquila for someone else who needs you? Would Paul find a place on your couch? Would Paul find a job at your place of business? Would he find comfort and encouragement in you? Would he find a friend in you? Would you take the kind of risk that Priscilla and Aquila took to have him in, his, in their homes and to work alongside them? You know, really, are you willing to do that even with the people that have walked into your lives already? As someone who's been on the receiving end of this type of relationship, I can't tell you how important it is. I can tell you that it will make a lasting impact on someone's life. And so now as it is Paul's pattern in his life and his ministry, um, he reasons in the synagogue on the Sabbath, trying to persuade them that Jesus is the Christ, the, the one that God had promised to come. And so Paul goes back to doing what he's always done. Now he's working alongside Aquila and Priscilla, but every Sabbath he's going into the synagogue and teaching about Jesus. He's providing for himself by making tents and using the synagogue as a platform for proclaiming Christ. So we see as we continue on in our passage in Acts, verses five and six in chapter 18, it says, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, upon first reading of this text, it kind of seems like when Silas and Timothy come into town and Paul's just kind of occupied, he's too busy for them. It kind of reads that way in the ESV. But if we look at it in NIV, it says this, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. I think that's a, a better reading. There's multiple translations that read like that. And so what we are seeing is that, that after T Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia to Corinth and, and hooked up with Paul, began to do work with him there, after they come, Paul is able to devote himself to ministry, specifically ministry of the word. And this is due to a couple of specific encouragement that, that, that they bring to Paul as brothers in Christ. First, they bring good news about what is happening in Thessalonica. Remember, Paul didn't have Facebook or Twitter. Um, so if he wanted to see how things were going with his friends, he had to talk to them in person or send a letter or receive news from other people. And so uh, the last thing that he knew about how things were going in Thessalonica were pretty bad. And when he left there, there were riots and people being roughed up and all kind of terrible things going on. He didn't know how things were going there. And so Silas and Timothy show up with a status update and it's good news. It's good news for Paul. And this good news is about how things are going there in Thessalonica, how the church has improved and is growing. And these are incredible things. And it's really, really encouraging to Paul as he hears it from his brothers. He actually writes to them in response to this good news while he's in Corinth. He writes this to the Thessalonians about all that he has heard. And we see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. But now that Timothy has come to us in Corinth from you in Thessalonica and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking 
in your faith. So we see here that Paul is, is pretty pumped up about this. I mean, he receives this good news. And just in reading this letter that he writes back to this church, man, he seems relieved to know that this church that he was a part of that he started is doing so well. So in all of the affliction he's been facing, he's encouraged because what he suffered in Thessalonica, the fear, the being run out of town, people being roughed up, God is using that. People are coming to faith in Christ. The church is growing up. And so as he, he's encouraged by that, by this good news from Silas and Timothy. In addition, Silas and Timothy bring money. That would encourage me as well. We see in 2 Corinthians of, uh, chapter 11 and verse 9, Paul says, and when I was with you, he's writing to the Corinthians and talking about when he was there. And when I was with you was I, when, and was in need, I did not burden anyone. So he doesn't ask the Corinthians for money. For the brothers who came from Macedonia, Silas and Timothy, supplied my need. And so I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. So Paul was able to insulate himself from the thinking that he was there in Corinth uh, just to make a buck um, for money purposes. He did that by working and also being provided for by people of another place, specifically Philippi. I mean, so we see in Philippians 4, verses 14 and 15, he's writing to them to thank them for the way that they encourage him. And he says this, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, so he's leaving Macedonia, going to Athens, and then ultimately to Corinth, where he is now, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. And so we see here the Philippians are giving to Paul and supporting his work. And so we conclude that this gift, this money, this encouragement that comes to Paul by Silas and Timothy is coming from the Philippian church. And this massive encouragement to Paul, both good news and monetary gifts, put him in a place to be able to commit fully to the work of ministry, the ministry of proclaiming the gospel. God's presence with him was so that he could go and continue the work of the gospel full time. And so we see some wind is being put back in Paul's sails. He has some good news about the church back in Macedonia. He has some money in his pocket and some of his closest friends by his side. And so now he's ready to get back at it. And so he became fully occupied with testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And as usual, when he does this, he faces opposition. They revile and mock him for what he is saying. And as they mock him, he shakes out his outer garment. Um, this was a significant sign to those gathered there because it points back to Nehemiah chapter five. Um, and in doing this, this is a, is a symbolic um, loosing himself from their responsibility or for his responsibility for them. Um, he solidifies this loosing, this physical loosing with a verbal loosing when he says, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go into the Gentiles and so we see here that Paul feels a personal responsibility for these people there, specifically for their souls. And it's not lightly that he relinquishes the responsibility for them. And that's because he knows what is at stake here. He knows that eternity is on the line for these people and he feels a personal responsibility for them. He desperately wants them to place their faith in Christ. And we too should feel the same sense of personal responsibility for those God has placed in our lives. After all, eternity is, is on the line for them as well as it is for you and I. God has chosen us, his people, just as he chose Paul to be the means by which the gospel goes out into the world. And so I only hope that we take it as seriously as Paul does in this passage. He is heartbroken that the Jews have rejected Christ, but he also knows that there are other people that need to hear the good news. And he feels the same, same sense of personal responsibility for them as well. And this is one of the many reasons I love Paul, that his, his undying passion to see the gospel go out into the world, for those to hear it, he will stop at nothing. This is also more evidence that God is with Paul during this time. Even in the face of much opposition, he continues to hold the gospel out in front of him to those that will listen. And I wonder this morning if, if you hold the good news of Christ 
in that same way. If you're here today, it's most likely that you hold the gospel to be true. But my question this morning is are you holding it like this or are you holding it like this as something to be shared with those around us? This is so important because God is sending people in and out of our lives every day so that they might hear and receive the good news that you have heard and received. And so will you see them? Will you care enough about them like Paul does here to tell them the good news of Christ? Paul is so passionate about doing this that he didn't let the Jewish opposition stop him from sharing it. He simply went to find others that would listen. And we see this in Acts 18, continuing in verse seven and eight. It says he left there, the synagogue, and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Listen to this. His house was next door to the synagogue. I love that. Like he walks out of the synagogue and goes next door and starts preaching the gospel. And then listen to this. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So Paul does exactly what he said he was going to do. He leaves the synagogue and literally walks right next door to the house of Titius and begins sharing the gospel. And something amazing happens. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, came to faith along with his entire family. This is a remarkable thing. Crispus was essentially the head of the Jewish synagogue. And of all the ones that you would expect to be tossing Paul out of there and sticking right there in the synagogue, you would think it would be him. But it was him that ultimately went with Paul. And it was him who ultimately followed Christ. This text tells us that many of the Corinthians would do the same thing after hearing Paul's message. We see here God providing a place, ironically, right next door to the synagogue. And Paul persevering through a difficult time so that the gospel continue, can continue to go out. And so I'd imagine Paul had kind of begun to feel on top of the world at this point, or at least better than he did coming into Corinth. God had shown his faithfulness to him through Aquila and Priscilla, through Silas and Timothy, and now through Titius and Crispus. And just to make sure that Paul knows with certainty that God is with him, God speaks to him in a vision in verses 9 and 11. It says this, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. I don't know about you, but it seems a little bit strange to me that Paul, that God would give Paul this message, this vision, just as things are beginning to go so well. Um, it seems like back in verse one, when Paul was coming into Corinth, beat down low, at his lowest point and coming into Corinth fearful and discouraged, it seems like that would have been a better time for this vision. But if we think back over Paul's journey, when things are going well for the kingdom of God, when people are coming to Christ, the church is coming together and growing, when the world is being turned upside down by the word of God, that's when Paul is receiving beatings and being imprisoned and run out of town. When nothing is going on really, usually Paul's okay. He can kind of just hang around. But when people are getting saved, particularly Jewish people, that's when things typically start going really bad for Paul. So this vision is right on time. This provision, this presence of God in Paul's life is right on time. God knew exactly what Paul needed. In this vision, the Lord speaks directly to how Paul is feeling. He knows what Paul needs to hear. And so he acknowledges Paul's fear. He said, don't be afraid. And he puts them to rest with his very own presence. He said, don't be afraid. I am with you. I am with you, the Lord says. So if God is with Paul, then who can be against Paul? The Lord goes on then to affirm what Paul has been doing and he insists that he keep on doing it. Keep on speaking. He sees what Paul has done already, speaking and reasoning and persuading, pursuing. He says, continue on in doing that. Don't be silent. 
keep on speaking. The Lord tells him no harm will come to him. And you know Paul had to be thinking that in the back of his mind. You know, oh, things are starting to go really great. People are coming to Christ. We're changing the world here. And he's thinking in the back of his mind, wait a second, this is about to go bad. And so you know this word from God had to be such a relief to Paul. And God makes this specific promise to him that he intends to keep, as we'll see here in just a moment. But then the Lord goes on to explain exactly what he should go on or why he should go on speaking. Um, This, I think, is the center of this whole passage and really this vision that God's given here. That Jesus says, I have many in this city who are my people. I have many in this city who are my people. The Lord is saying to Paul, there are many people here in this city that will come to faith in me. I've died for these specific people. And so you don't have to be fearful of of the results of your work or any persecution you might face. I am with you. I have gone before you so that you can simply be faithful. Faithful to speak the truth of the gospel because the doors of the gospel are wide open there. So that's exactly what Paul did. He stays there for 18 months teaching and preaching. And now remember, Paul has been bounced from town to town to town for the past year. So this is the longest time he's spent anywhere. And I'm sure this was a welcome change for Paul. That doesn't mean all of his time there was easy, but God was faithful to keep his promise to Paul. No harm would come to him. And so let's look And our last set of verses this morning in Acts 18, verses 12 through 17. It says, But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the judge there, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, Oh, Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to judge of these things. And he literally drove them out of the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So we see here, as usual, the Jews come after Paul. By God's grace, it took a while for it to get to this point, but nevertheless, they eventually drag him before the local judge, charging him with breaking some laws. And so just as Paul is about to speak up to defend himself, as he so does often, the local judge basically just shuts the whole thing down, insisting that no laws had been broken and that all of their complaints were just a matter of semantics, just a disagreement of words but no grounds for any charges. And so then the judge proceeds to eject the crowd from the court like a, like a judge would do. And then like a good mob, the crowd, the crowd found someone else to beat. They found poor Sosthenes, the new ruler of the synagogue. And I'm sure Crispus is over here standing next to Paul looking on to what's going on thinking, man, I'm sure glad I got out of there when I did. That whole leader of the synagogue thing isn't going well. And so what's most noticeable about this passage and this part of our passage specifically is that all that was asked of Paul and promised to be done was done. Paul resisted the temptation to be fearful and went on speaking. The Lord ensured that Paul was not harmed even though he was once again charged with crimes. And lastly, the Lord kept the promise that he had made about the city, that he had many people there in that city. And so as we look at at Corinth and its history, we see the church in Corinth grew to be a fairly large church. We see that God was faithful to bring his people to himself, even those who were very unlikely to come. And so turn over with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just a couple chapters over. We're going to look at verse 1 together really briefly. It's just so interesting to see God work as he is among his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, as you look at that, look at that verse. And and who does it say there is the author of this letter, the 1 Corinthians? It says Paul at first glance. But if you keep reading, what does it say? 
Sosthenes. Sosthenes. Now, I suppose there's a chance that Sosthenes was the most popular kid name in the first century. That's possible. I doubt it. This is most likely the exact, the exact same Sosthenes that was just drugged into the street and beaten by a mob of Jews, probably in his eyes because of what Paul did. But we see here that Sosthenes ends up being a very useful person in God's kingdom. He seems to be working right alongside Paul as he writes this letter to the Corinthians. This is pretty unlikely for this to happen. It's also pretty unlikely that two rulers from the same synagogue would come to Christ in 18 months. That's pretty unlikely. In fact, this whole account could be considered unlikely. It's pretty unlikely that Paul would find such dear friends in a new city, a place where he never has been before. It's pretty unlikely that Silas and Timothy would show up at just the right time when, with good news and financial support for Paul. It's pretty unlikely that the house right next door to the synagogue would become the meeting place for the church in Corinth. That's pretty unlikely. It's pretty unlikely that the judge of this city would side with Paul, the leader of a new sect in Rome, rather than siding with the local Jews, the religion of Rome. Yes, all these things are pretty unlikely, unless, unless God is at work in Corinth. It's pretty unlikely unless God has people there in Corinth. It's pretty unlikely that a self-centered guy who didn't touch a Bible until he was 21 years old would be standing before you teaching the Bible right now. But I am. It's pretty unlikely that we're reading about an apostle that once, at one time, killed Christians as a way to show his devotion to God. But we are. It's also pretty unlikely that God would put on flesh and die so he could save the likes of you and I, but he did. All of this is unlikely, if not impossible, if God isn't with us, but he is. God was clearly with Paul as he journeyed into Corinth and ministered the gospel there. You just need to pay attention to the text we just read through this story. We see God present there in church, God is clearly with us here. You need just look around the room and see story after story after story of God's presence. Families, individuals, men, women, children, making a difference for the kingdom of God because God is present here. I could tell you countless stories of God's presence in the life of our church and around this community. We've seen his presence in our struggles, in our triumphs, but I think we would be missing the point of this passage if we didn't talk about the purpose and the reason for God's presence in our lives. To do that, let's just take a quick flyover of our passage today as we zoom back over that and see how Paul responded to God's presence in his life and how that might inform how we would respond. As you see Paul coming into Corinth, meeting Aquila and Priscilla, providing work for him, that relationship, God provided that relationship, he provided his presence through that relationship so that Paul could go on in ministering the gospel. Paul experienced God's presence through Silas and Timothy so that he could go on and be fully devoted to the ministry of the gospel. Paul experienced God's presence in Titius and Crispus so that he could go on and preach the gospel. Paul's experiencing God's presence so that he can go on speaking and not be silent. God is present in the good things that Paul experienced. God is present in the hard things that he experienced, the victories and the challenges. God is with Paul. Likewise, he is with us. 
not only is he with us, he's with us so that we can go on speaking and not be silent. It's so important that we think about this rightly before we leave here today. Understanding that God is with us is critical to our faith. It is. It is one of his great promises to us. It is the foundation by which we find our hope and strength for this life and the life to come. But if we miss why God and his sovereignty chooses to be with us in this life, we will at best have a limited understanding, but at worst completely miss God's call in our life to go and make disciples. If we follow Paul's example from this passage and rightly understand God's call and the Great Commission to go and make disciples, we see that God keeps his promises to be with us so that we can be like Paul and look for every opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. God's presence in the midst of life's situations should motivate us to take the good news of the gospel to everyone in our lives. Every one of you brought a situation, a circumstance into this room this morning. I know that because I did. It might be small, it might be huge. It might be just a little positive and it might be terrible. Some of your stories in here, some of the things that you're dealing with right now might cripple some of us in this room. Some of the things that Paul dealt with throughout his ministry and specifically here in Corinth where he experienced God's presence, it would change our lives. But what we see in that is that through each and every scenario, each and every situation, each and every circumstance that life threw at God, that life threw at Paul, God was present. And church, I'm here to tell you with confidence the same is true for you and I. No matter your situation, no matter what you're dealing with, whatever it is, you you may be dealing with some unimaginable thing that's so hard that you don't see the answer in. I can tell you, church, that God promises to be with you in that. And church, what I want us to know this morning is that God is with us in those circumstances so that we can continue on in the gospel. Maybe you're having a hard time at work with a coworker. I'm here to tell you that God will be with you in that so that you can go on proclaiming the good news to that coworker. Maybe your family dynamics are just a wreck right now. Pray for God's presence to be there. God is with you in that circumstance, not just for your comfort or for your relief, though that would be great. He is with you, present with you in that situation like he was for Paul, so that you can continue on in the ministry that he's given you, primarily to go and make disciples. And so I think it's so helpful for us to look through the lens of God being with us so that we can continue on in the ministry that he's given us. So I wanna wanna ask you this morning to avoid the temptation to say, woe is me. Avoid the temptation to let the circumstances of your life swallow you up and to see them how Paul sees them as opportunities to experience God's presence so that we can go on speaking and not being silent. We can enter into that Situation, whatever it is, understanding that God promises his presence, both for our comfort and relief, but primarily so that we can go on doing what he's called us to do, making disciples. I pray that that is our vision through this passage today, that in the same way that Paul confronted every experience he came up with as an opportunity to to lean into God, and then lean back into people. This is huge. This is huge for us as a church because we live in a world that tells us it's all about us. It's all about me, what I need, and if God doesn't provide that, he's not a good God. That's not the story we just read in Paul's story. 
Did God provide for Paul? Yes, he did in a numerous amount of ways. But he provided for Paul in those ways so that he could go and make disciples. And he's done the exact same thing for you and I. And that should be the most encouraging thing you've heard this morning. That we as believers in Christ have been called to go and make disciples and God's promise of his presence is the fuel that gives us the ability to go and do that. And so we're gonna close in just a moment with a time of response. And so there's a few ways you can respond to something like this. One, God's presence may sound like a foreign concept to you if you're here this morning and don't know Christ. And so for you, first and foremost, you need to experience God's presence for the very first time through faith in Christ. Faith in what he's done for you and for me on the cross. Another way you might respond to this is to say, man, I'm in a situation. I'm in a place, I'm in a hard place and I need to first and foremost lay that thing down right here in this place. I need to lay it down and experience God's presence in it so that I can go out and continue this thing that God's given me to do and make disciples. You might simply say, I've missed the opportunities to do that. And you ask God to to revive this heart in you to go and make disciples because he is with you, because he is with us. A church that recognizes God's presence and uses that as fuel to action is an unstoppable church. If God is with us, then who can be against us? Let's pray. God, we are incredibly grateful for your presence among us. We are humbled that you would choose in your sovereignty to be with us. What a gift. What a gift that you would be with us in good times and in hard times. You would be with us in relationships, in loneliness and financial trouble and hardships. God, you are with us and that is good news for us, Lord. And let our response be to go and make disciples so that God, you can be with others as well. God, I pray this morning if there's a time, if there's someone who needs to take advantage of this time to respond here in faith, to accept the good news of the gospel, that we were made in God's image, but that image was messed up by sin, but you made a way through your son Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection for us to be made right with you, God. If somebody needs to respond to that for the first time today, Lord, let this be the day of salvation for them. God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. God, help us to leave this place different than we came in. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. For love is passing by. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens lifted and carried far away. And precious blood has washed away. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus and live. Like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to grow. And remember when you walk, sometimes we Sometimes the way is lonely and steep 
been filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, then cry to Jesus. Cry to Jesus. Cry to Jesus. When you can't contain your joy inside, then dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, and live. And with your final heartbeat, yes, the world. Go in peace, laugh on glory's side, and fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus. Yeah, it's okay to clap. Amen, man. <laughs> Guys, I can't tell you what a joy it is for me to be here with you this morning. And as we close our corporate time of worship, um, know that if God's working, moving in your life, the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, that doesn't end because this ends. So if you need to talk with someone, to pray with someone, and someone to pray with you, we'll be right here after the service. And uh, we want to do that with you and for you. I do want to let you guys know about a couple of announcements, a couple of things coming up in the life of our church. Uh, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas choir rehearsals, that's hard to say. Um, so we have an additional uh, choir rehearsal going on. Brad wanted me to let you guys know about. If you can't make the Wednesday night rehearsal, but you want to be a part of the Christmas at Hillcrest Choir, um, they've added an alternate time for Sundays at 4 p.m., and that starts tonight, it says. So it happens right down in the choir practice room, and so that's um, 6.30 on uh, Wednesday nights and then four o'clock beginning this Sunday, so that's good. Uh, also coming up, I want to let you guys know about a little Spanish trail plug here. Coming up on September 23rd um, at 6 p.m., uh, we are having a night of praise at the Spanish Trail Campus. We've done this a handful of times. Many of you have come, and we would invite you to come back. Uh, so that's coming up September 23rd at 6 p.m., um, and we want to see you guys there uh, to just worship God. That night is all about just praising God for his goodness and his faithfulness. That's kind of the focus of the night, and we'll take the Lord's Supper.